Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and these are my two adorable and handsome sons. And that is my ex-husband, attorney Dennis Sperling. He practices personal injury law and will be more than happy to help you with claims arising from automobile accidents. He doesn't get paid unless you get paid. And as we first wives know, the more our ex-husbands get paid, the more we get paid. So let me help him help you. Call Mr. Mm -hmm. Sperling at 713-229-0770. Call my dad, dad, dad. All right, we're going to talk about stock. All right. Make sure you introduce yourself. All right. I'm telling everything you know about Introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Ron. I'm going to be up here. Hello, my name is Ronan Sperling, and I will be talking to you about Shaka Zulu. Um, Shaka Zulu was an African king, and he developed the war tactic. But before he was a king, he was a general. And also, um, he didn't have a good father, but his father tried to kill him, but he didn't die. Um, also, um, um, his mother, his father, um, he had a lot of kids and, uh, he and his two stepbrothers tried to kill him. Um, also, uh, the white man tried to invade his land, but he didn't let them until his brothers killed him. But he knew his brothers were coming up from behind him, but he but he thought it was time for him to go. Um. All right, thank you so much, sir. All right, okay. This is my young assistant here. My uh, son, Roman, is here to help. Roman, thank you so much, I appreciate you. Sitting in for daddy. Uh, Rome, yeah. let's make sure everybody now. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Roman is basing a lot of his facts on the movie Shaka Zulu, right? Yeah. And that introduced you to Shaka. Come on over here, sit on daddy's lap. Oh, oh my God, you're so big now. That introduced him to Shaka, Shaka Zulu. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions. Was Shaka a great warrior? Yes. Remember when you were younger, we would ask, I would ask you stuff like, well, what was, a lot of people say, well, what would Jesus do? And what would I ask you? What would Shaka do? <laughs> what would Shaka think about some of the things he sees on television some days? What do you, what do you think Shaka would think about somebody, a grown man crying or something like that? Because, and what would Shaka do to somebody like that? We hit him. And what would he do if they were in his army, in his corral? Kill them all. He would kill them all. Now, pass me that book. Now, when Roman was about uh, maybe eight, nine years old, I asked him to read this book. Okay. This book is the book by E.A. Ryder, and it's called Shaka Zulu. Now, this is a more accurate depiction of, uh, of the life story of King Shaka. OK. And so it also talks about how Shaka liked to dance with his people. And many of the things that people say about Shaka are just not true. Shaka didn't kill his firstborn son. He, um, he had many children. Many of the movies that we read are distortion of the truth. OK, they're distortion because they take our greatest heroes and they distort the truth about it. why would they not want you to know about how 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 
they tell you how ferocious he is, but they turn that ferociousness into, in, evil. into evil. You see what I mean? So now yeah. you get a picture of another evil black man. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so you have to read the history for yourself. Shaka used to dance with his people. You yeah. know that? He would get out in the middle and dance with his people. You understand yeah. that? He would go out yeah. and hunt, hunting. And, and now he was serious about his warlike tactics. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He was very serious. You see, he was serious because why? Because it's war and he doesn't want anybody taking his land mm -hmm. or property or killing off his people. Killing off his people. Who is the, who is the, who is the, uh, what did the, what did the Zulus call their God? Uh, what did they used to say? You remember Dennis? Yeah. Just, they, he, they were Zulu. I'm a Zulu. Oh. Yeah. So, come on over so, here, Dennis. Come on over. This is my oldest son. We just okay. came from dinner. Come on in here. No, he's good. Come on in here. You come over here. Uh, so tell us what you know about Shaka that we had now. This is Dennis Amon Ross Berlin. This is my oldest son. Tell us what you know about Shaka. Uh, the Shaka Zulu was the king of the was the leader of the Zulus, and he he changed how war worked inside of uh south africa now what what i want to ask you guys is this what made shaka have that i don't know that that was his life easy as a child did he have no. an xbox his father tried to kill him his, his yeah. father rejected him yeah. yeah but was but but did shaka have a was he a uh was he pampered and no. did he have it easy no, no. He had to live with his mom and he had oh, to. Oh, yeah, and they were constantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't he have a sister? Yeah, yeah. he had to yeah. go to his mom's village and then they didn't want him oh, there yeah. either. Now, you boys do something that, that Shaka does a lot, or Shaka do. What is similar between your life and how Shaka's life is? What do you guys do that they date? Oh, we do uh, martial arts. But not more. You fight. Oh, yeah. yeah we fight. You fight. How long have you been fighting? Eight or six, eight, eight or nine years. Wait, how, no, eight years. And how old are you? I'm 11. Do you ever remember not fighting? No, I started with well, all So before you even knew anything, you were fighting? Yeah, eight years. And so you, what daddy is doing is I'm de developing a warrior mentality in you. You understand what that is? Yeah. You have a lot more in common with Shaka than most people. Most of our black brothers here in America they know how to fight, a lot of them, some don't. But the bottom line is you were raised in this culture of fighting and you understand when to fight, how to fight, where to fight. How many fights do you think you've been in in your lifetime, Roman? Um, I don't know, I know I can't count. I how mean, many you think has been, Dennis? Maybe um, Huh? A lot, I don't, I don't know how many exactly. Okay. Or maybe like- Eight you. How many times a week do you fight? Uh, we go once every like one week, yeah. once every week, or and it used to be twice every week. Okay, and what about in the other? What have you added oh, the jujitsu? Well, twice with? every other week. Okay, what have you added the jujitsu into? To twice mm -hmm. every week. Yeah, I think. You know, three more, times every week. Yeah. So you have four fights a week. Yeah. yeah. And you've been having four fights a week for how long? Uh, eight years. Eight years. Yeah. yeah. So how many weeks in a month? 52. Yeah. <laughs> so four times 52. Four times That's 108. So you have 108 fights a year. 108 times four. 52 times four. So you fought 108 times every year. And how, in all those days when you fight, how many people do you fight? How many different matches do you have? Two, two or three. Two. So you fought 108 times, different times. Yeah, 208. But then you fought different people. So every time in that. So 1,616. Yeah, but that's just the days you fought. Yeah. That didn't, How many actual fights have you had? If you multiply oh. that times three. 1,600. 624. So it's 624 fights a year. 624 times eight. Yeah, but but no, he's saying it's 624. So you basically had almost 5,000 5, different 
physical confrontations, whether it be wrestling, sparring, full contact. And plus sensei. Oh, and plus sensei. Also awesome. and, and you've gone overseas to and fight. Cool. So do you understand how your perspective is very similar to, to Shaka? Yeah. Fighting somebody is no big deal to you, right? Yeah. It's, it's just like, like, I don't know, drinking water is something you're used to, right? Yeah. Can you already see the punches coming now? Yeah. yeah. Can you see the kicks coming? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Predictable. It's predictable. Shaka is like that because Shaka had to come up with that warrior spirit. He didn't know anything other than that. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And so do you think you can enslave a warrior? No. I'm going to ask you a question. You know how we studied a little bit about um, our brother, King Mansa Musa, right? Oh, yeah. In Ghana. It said his people, they lived, they had a high, uh, what's the word, a high standard of living. What does that mean? Um, they live richly. They live richly. High standard. And, and what happened when the white people found out Mansa Musa had all that gold over there? They tried to invade him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm hmm And what, what do you think happens if you get used to a high standard of living? You you don't yeah. want to let it go. Yeah. Or but what else does it do to you? What, you what happens? Say again, Dennis. You become Say again, Dennis. You become softer. You become softer. Are you starting to see what I'm talking about yeah, here? You don't yeah. have an incentive to learn how to oh, fight. Oh, yeah. What did daddy first tell you about fighting? You need it's the be, first thing you need to learn. You should learn. You you it's you like could be you can be able to fight without having to be able to read. Oh yeah. What did I say and how the, I said? It? It's the first thing you should learn. You should learn how to fighting fight. Fighting is the yeah. first thing you should learn. What what did fighting. I specifically say as which one is more important? Fighting is more important than reading. reading. And learning to read and write. Why is that? Because you, should, you can learn to read and write but still get beat up. Mm -hmm. And how is your life going to be if somebody can always come in and take your things? Not good. What if what if you have a house or a woman or your children? Somebody can always come in and beat you up and take your things. Steal your stuff. All Very the effort bad. you put into that is worth nothing. It's worth nothing. Yeah. So daddy told you that learning to fight is more important than learning how to read. Now, of course, you boys know how to read, right? Yeah. You can yeah. undo your buttons, so. right? Of course you can, right? Yeah. Right? You get that. Okay. But the other thing I want you to ask you, Shaka, his culture. Right? Yeah. He's a warrior culture, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't did you ever hear about them going down to to Zulu, the Zulu land and taking those Zulu warriors as slaves? No. no. Who did they take as slaves? The other uh, people. The people from the Gambia, the people from West Africa, the people who had what, Dennis? They had gotten what? Soft. 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 You are you starting to see now? Are you yeah, guys starting yeah. to see the importance of this conversation? Yeah. You never forsake, you never forsake your warrior instincts. You don't ever live too softly. Daddy has made your life very difficult, haven't yeah. uh, Tell them yeah. what your typical day is like on a, uh, let's say a Friday, Dennis. On Friday, we do school and then you bring us to our Krav Maga class and then we go to our Jiu Jitsu class. Okay, and those, each one of those an hour, right? Yeah. And then what do you do on a Friday, Dennis? Or uh, what do you do on a Thursday? On a Thursday, when you pick us. To, you pick, we go to school, then you pick us up, and then we go to Kung Fu, and then we go to Muay Thai. Okay, so you and Dennis, you're the captain of the Muay Thai team, right? Mm -hmm. That's kickboxing. Is it? Is do you have to? Is it hard in kickboxing? Do you get hit sometimes in the head, in yes. your stomach? Is it difficult? Yes. Yeah. Is it? Is it? It's still difficult, but you do it, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, what does your typical Saturday look like? What time do you get up in the morning on Saturday? Nine, nine a.m. What time do you get up in the morning on oh, Saturday? like seven or eight. And then what do you do after that? Then we get up. And then and we put on our geese. And then we go into the garage, open the truck. Then we put on our geese, and then we drive to Sensei's place. And then um, we go to Sensei. And, and how long does that last? One hour. And then what do you do after? And it's outside, huh? Yeah. The sensei care of is cold? No. The sensei care of is hot? No. The sensei care of is raining on your head? No. Do you have to do push ups on your knuckles with the rocks down there? Yes. And then what else do you do after that? Then we go to the fencing class. Mm hmm. And then, and how long is that? That's one hour. And then what do you do after that? 
after that, we go home and lift weights. Well, before you go home, what do you do first? Before you go to Sensei, we go across town to. We go to. Oh Kansas. yeah. Black Rod. Yeah, we got a country. country. Rock. And what do you yes. do there? We, we um, our we special class. With Coach Ryan. And how long did the last last week? You had Coach Drew two and Coach Ryan. Two or one, hour. Two one or two hours. And what do you have to fight, Coach Ryan? Yes. yes. Who is Coach Ryan? He's an MMA. He's a, the MMA fighter. The professional. Does he hit you? Yes. yes. Does he kick you in the head? Yes. Yeah. Was Shaka approved? Yes. Yeah. Shaka would like the way you boys are being raised, right? Yeah. Yeah. Shaka would say, yeah, that's a good Zulu warrior training that you're going through, right? Yeah. Do you think you'll ever be slaves? No. Why? Can you ever put a warrior in slavery? No. Why? Because they're too strong. Because a warrior is what? Always oh, fight gonna back. Fight a warrior back. is always going to what? Fight back. A warrior is always going to fight back. And that's why they left Shaka alone. They invaded him, but they got him in different ways. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? They corrupted his people through yeah. greed. They didn't, they didn't, they, didn't, they tried to run over Zulu land, but it didn't work. Yeah. He fought too hard. That was the only country, the Zulu land was the only country that those Europeans tried to invade. They just couldn't because Shaka instituted a whole militarized plan. This was the fundamental difference between Shaka Zulu. And all of these different African kings, Shaka was not about that negotiation. He didn't want to talk about it. You come over here, I'm going to stab you to death. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to throw everybody at you. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? That's a warrior. Also, um, they had revived the girl, and then everybody was thinking they were God. So he stabbed the girl, and then he told them, revive her now. Is that ruthless? Yeah. yeah. You understand why Shaka did that? Because they were going to think that the, the white, white man was almighty, almighty and could heal everybody. So you understand why Shaka had to do that? Yeah. That was ruthless, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now, put yourself in Shaka's position. Would you do it? What would you have done? Um, if you had those two choices? What, what would have happened if he let these people? Oh, they would have just stolen off his land. Yeah, yeah but what would have happened if he let his own people think these white people were stronger than him? They would stop listening to him. And so what was Shaka's decision? He had to kill the girl. So yeah. based on that decision, what would you do? If you um, were Shaka. Kill the girl. Yeah. That's a hard decision, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's necessary, right? Yeah. That's a warrior's decision, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You understand that? Yeah. yeah. I appreciate you, boys. Get on out of here. Y'all can change clothes. That is going to have a session with the brothers. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate your time. Thank you all for being patient. But these are the type of conversations I have with my sons so that I make these people, these ancient heroes, real to my boys. These are the real life decisions that, are, that, that these men made. These are hard decisions, some will consider. But the bottom line is these are our kings. Now, the difference between Shaka. Amazul and, and Shaka's whole name is, I want to put this information up here, uh, but before, before I get started, I want to definitely give a shout out. Thank you so much, Sheldon Abrams. Salute to the fellas, Uncle D. Hail Zulu Kingdom. Shout out Malika. I appreciate you guys, man. Uh, I know it's late. You know, we're 26 minutes in, man, but, uh, you know, I want to let you know that the stuff that I teach you guys, that I talk to you guys about, are the same conversations I have with my sons. And the reason I do that is because they need to know their history so that when someone comes in and tries to tell them otherwise, that they they are already full of knowledge and they know. So, you know, without further ado, what I want to do is I want to first provide a little brief video that uh, discusses Shaka Zulu. It's not long. It's only two minutes. So let's hang in there for a minute and check this out. It's called Shaka Zulu Founding Father. So let's check this out. OK. So basically, it says the Shaka was rejected by his father and he was, you know, teased by other kids.
Daka was ruthless. He was not. He was the. He assassinated his brother's his brother, his second oldest, uh, his father's second oldest son, who was had by a legitimate uh, legitimate mom, and he ascended to the throne. Daka was ruthless. As a king, he punishes who bullied him and his mother. He initiates reform and forms a centralized this, this is what he did. The transformation of the army. Shaka introduces new weapons and uniforms. Bigger spears, shorter, short, bigger, wider tip spears, shorter, uh, longer shields. These same tactics were used to defeat the British and when they invaded, look at the movie Zulu Dawn. This is where Shaka was from. This is the same South Africa. Beautiful country. Now here's the thing about Shaka. Either you join me or you die. This is where Shaka, this was his philosophy. See, Shaka was ruthless. This isn't... <laughs> This, this, he would be called a toxic masculinist if, if he was alive today. So let's keep it, it worked. In 1828, he was assassinated by his half brother, Ding, Ding Gang. The shock remains one of the most influential monarchs in the Zulu kingdom. Spirit of Shaka, Zulu Warriors inspires many anti apartheid. Right. Okay. So that's a quick summary. Many, of, unfortunately, fellas, many of you guys have never known who Shaka Zulu was. Some of us who were young in the 80s, we grew up, we watched the movie Shaka Zulu, but that's not a movie that people oftentimes refer to. So let's read a little bit more about Shaka Zulu and we're going to learn as black men what it is we can learn from them. And I'm going to go ahead. Uh, and those of you who are already privy to Shaka, I'm, I know some of you know so much. Some of you actually read the books that I've read. We know a lot about Shaka already. So I'm going to open the chat room right now. Feel free to donate to the Cash App, the Super Chat and the PayPal as we move forward. Uh, but, you know, in essence, yeah, we're talking about our ancient heroes, but we're, we're also talking about masculinity. We, we're not going to sit around and wait for them to emasculate us. No, what we're going to do is we're going to reach back to our ancestors who are here with us anyway. So we really don't have to reach back and we're going to draw from them and we're going to begin to build ourselves up. See, the reason that I'm putting my sons through what we call warrior training is because that's what many of our African ancestors did. They put their sons through a rites of passage, which is what I'm doing, which is why they have to get up every day and do these manly things, and along with martial arts. They also learn many other things that I have to teach them. You see? So, uh, uh, you know, these are things that are important in order to build up men to be, you can't just raise them and dress them like they have to become men. But anyway, uh, this is what I do. Um, in my life. And so I, I mean what I say. I'm not just talking out the side of my head. Shaka, King, and I, I want to make sure we got some brothers here from South Africa. Please correct me on this. Uh, Shaka pronunciation. Uh, Shaka, Sidigi, Kinzanga. I don't want to, I don't even want to butcher the brother's name. But he was a king of the Zulu kingdom from 1816. To, to, to 1828, so only 12 years. He was one of the most influential monarchs of the Zulu kingdom responsible for reorganizing the Zulu military into a formidable force via series of wide reaching and influential reforms. King Shaka was born in the lunar month of July in the year of 1787, near present day Milmouth, KwaZulu Natal province. The son of the Zulu chief, Sinzangu, Sinzang, Gakona. Sinzanga Kona spurned as an illegitimate son. Shaka spent his childhood in his mother's settlements where he was initiated into the uh, Mbufo Limpe fighting unit serving as a warrior under Dingi Swaya. Shaka, Shaka further refined the Ibufu military system and with the 
myth uh, empires support over the next several years forge alliances with his smaller neighbors to counter the growing threat from Gwandi raids uh, from the north. The initial Zulu maneuvers were primarily defensive as Shaka preferred to apply pressure diplomatically. They don't tell you that. They tell you our brother was a savage. They tell you all he did was get out and kill people. He killed his mama and all his baby. And all. They don't tell you he, Shaka, preferred to apply pressure diplomatically with an occasional strategic assassination. Shaka was cunning. You understand that? He was ruthless, but he was also cunning. He wasn't some savage barbarian killing everyone in front of him. They like to equate that. Like my son told you guys, anytime you have a black man who is as ruthless as the typical European invader, then they always want to vilify that black man. Shaka was the answer. That mentality was the answer. That's why they never actually invaded uh, Zululand while Shaka was there. Shaka, in fact, took the took the initiative, took the uh, offenses, and, and planned to invade the, the Cape. So let's continue watching. His reforms of local society built on, an, on, on existing structures, although he preferred social and, pro, uh, and, and uh, propagand, uh, propagandistic political methods, he also engaged in a number of battles. He was ultimately assassinated by his half-brothers, Dengang and Mifgan. Shaka's reign coincided with the start of the Mifkan, Difkan upheaval or crushing, a period of devastating warfare and chaos in Southern Africa between 1850 and 1840 that depopulated the region. His, re his, ro his role in the Mifkan, Difkan is highly controversial. Okay, so we can talk a little bit more about this. Um, you know, this is basically about his childhood and how he came up. Um, but for the most part, it talks a lot about this brother. But some things that that aren't often talked about is that Shaka loved his people and he was loved by his people. They respected him. Remember, he was dealing with a fierce group of people here. And in order to be a leader of a fierce group of people, you've got to be fierce and they've got to respect you. As I told you, brothers, before. Well, respect is not available. Fear is sufficient. And Shaka struck, struck fear and in, into, into the hearts of his enemies and his friends loved him. He gave them a choice. Either you join with the Zulu and we will be one people, or I'm going to, I'm going to return you to the earth. So this is, this is a warrior here. And you have to understand, he thinks like a warrior. So uh, there's so much here to digest. But the main thing is, fellas, what we want to do is we want to uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the innovations he put. Some older his histories have doubted the military and social innovations customarily attributed to Shaka, denying them outright or attributing them variously to European influence. More modern researchers argue that such explanations fall short and that the general Zulu culture, which included other tribes and clans, contained a number of practices that Shaka could have drawn on to fulfill his objectives, whether in raiding, conquest, or, or homogeny. Some of these practices are shown below. Weapons changes. Shaka is often said to have been dissatisfied with the long-throwing assegai and is credited with having introduced a new variant of weapon, the, the Iklawa, a short stabbing spear with long, broad, and sword-like spearhead. What does that tell you about a man who says, no, nah, we're not going to throw our spears from a long way away? What we're going to do is we're going to cut the handles off, widen the blade, and we're going to get right up close on the person. What kind of confidence do you have to have to say, no, I'm going to beat you in hand-to-hand -hand battle. I'm not going to fight you from way off. I believe I can beat you. And mind you, Shaka was about a head taller than all the other Africans. In other words, he was about six foot two, six foot three, when all the rest of the Africans were under six feet tall. This is what you... Another thing that we need to understand about Shaka, but Shaka was confident. Shaka was ruthless. Shaka was calculating. Shaka was also diplomatic. So these are some things you need to understand. Shaka would also dance and party with his people. You understand what I'm saying? So these are the things that you need to understand who we deal with. This is who we're dealing with. Here's another thing that I read in this book by E.A. Rogers. That was E.A. Ritter. One day Shaka was sitting around his corral and he looked at his court. And he became disgusted at the fact that all of his people, all of his leadership had gotten fat. Here he is putting pressure 
on his soldiers to stay fit, to stay trim and lean. And these people got getting fat. So what did he do? He set everybody up and they start running. And apparently they ran for weeks. <laughs> they literally would get up and run all day across the South African plain with his guard. Anybody that fell down and died or anybody that fell down was stabbed as they lay. In other words, you don't deserve to live. So he, that was how he, you going to run. This, is, this was a military corral. You think the Spartans were bad? They would last in Shaka's, in, in Shaka's corral. That's one thing that he did. Another thing that he did was um, he learned so much. He could have easily slaughtered all the Europeans that got uh, stranded uh, on the coast. But what he did was he sat and he dissected them. He learned them and he used that information and was planning to invade and remove them. You see what I'm saying? He basically entertained them and rebuffed them. I mean, he entertained them, but only for the point because he wanted to know who they were. He never trusted them. He simply entertained them. So uh, that's a couple of things that we've learned. Um, the throwing spear was not discarded, but used as an initial missile weapon before close contact with the enemy when the shorter stabbing spear was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It is also supposed that Shaka introduced larger, heavier version of the Ninguyu shield. Further, it is believed that he taught his warriors how to use the shield's left side to hook the enemy's shield to the right exposing the enemy's ribs for fatal spear blow. In Shaka's time, these cowhide shields were supplied by the king and they remained the king's property. Different colored shields distinguished different Amabufu within Shaka's army. Some had black shields, others used white shields with black spots and some had white shields with brown spots while others used pure brown or white shields. Now here's another thing you gotta understand. Shaka separated his army, the younger, faster Zulus, they were oftentimes put out at the ends. The older, bigger, stronger, slower Zulus, that was that represented the bullhead. So as he rushed his enemy, it was basically they got hit with a right cross and a left cross and they were surrounded. So now they're forced to fight what's in front of them and also what is at their flanks. And so now you got to fight somebody in front of you and somebody to your right. And if you wait long enough, they'll be behind you. So they basically encapsulate them in the bullhorns and suffocate. Them. This is how Shaka was able to wipe out so many of his adversaries. And the same thing he did to the British army when they came, or, or the technique was used against the British army when they invaded. Uh, and, and check out this movie called Zulu Dawn, like Dawn of the Day, Zulu Dawn. And it, it, it shows that. Now let's talk about the mobility of the army. Shaka did some amazing things. This is before they had tanks jeeps and motorcycles his ability to move his army ran 50 miles a day 50 miles a day a marathon is 24.6 miles and when i see people running those miles a lot of them are passing out his army ran 50 miles a day let's read it the story that sandals were discarded to toughen the feet of the Zulu warriors has been noted in various military accounts, such as the washing of the spears, like lions they fought, and the anatomy of a Zulu army. I'm going to put those books here because I want you to read. Basically, Shaka told them, y'all y'all not going to wear sandals. We're going to run barefoot, just like the antelope, because those sandals slow you down. Implementing Implementation was typically blunt. Those who objected to going without sandals were simply killed. This is Shaka's army. <laughs> this was not a democracy. You understand me? This was a dictatorship. Shaka drilled his troops frequently in forced marches that sometimes covered more than 80 kilometers, 50 miles a day in a fast trot. We're not talking about a jog. We ain't talking about push number one or number two. We're going to jog, walk on the treadmill at LA Fitness. This is a fast, this is not a fast trot. <laughs> okay, this is this is a day, a fast trot over hot rock and terrain. You on the hop with this. You are running. He also drilled the troops to carry out encirclement tactics. That's the thing that I refer to, refer to the bullhorn. Historian John Lambad dismisses these stories as myth writing. What are we to make then of the European trader Henry Francis Finn's statement that once Zulu army reached hard? At Stony Ground in 1826, Shaka ordered sandals 
of oxide to be made for himself. That's, we don't know that. It, you know, this is just white. That's the one. Okay, Shaka had some, yeah, we got it, right. Remember, they're always going to be looking for things to show that these black men didn't do the things that they know that they did because they have to, because we can't have these brothers be seen as Superman. Landman also dismissed the idea of 80 kilometers a day because he know his big wide butt couldn't run 80 miles a day, but you don't know what these black men were doing. In March, March in a single day is ridiculous. He further claims that even though these stories have been repeated by astonishing and admiring white commentators, so otherwise all these white people are saying these dudes ran 50 miles a day. Of course, there's no way possible, even though it's documented. Um, let me see here. Furthermore, Zulus under shock are sometimes advanced more slowly. They spent two whole days recuperating in one instance. On the other, they rested for a day and two nights. Here's a crazy thing. Um, there is a story that that uh, that was documented, that's well documented, where they had a situation where the British Army thought the Zulu was one place. And then it turned out they were 60 miles in a different location because the Zulus, they saw them there, and all of a sudden they appeared somewhere else. 60 miles away, and it happened in one day. And they were like, that's amazing. You see what I mean? So think about that. Now I want you guys to listen to this. This is what Shaka did to his army. Um, boys and girls age six and over, six and over, joined Shaka's force as an apprentice warriors and served as carriers of rations, supplies like cooking pots and sleeping mats and extra weapons until they joined the main ranks. It sometimes held that such support we use more for very light forces designed to extract tribute to the cattle and slaves from neighboring groups. Nevertheless, the concept of light forces is questionable. The fast moving Zulu raiding party uh, or mission invariably travel light driving catalyst provisions on the hook and they were not weighted down with heavy weapons and supplies. See, some of this stuff is so unbelievable to them. Even they, they just can't fathom. It. This is what I'm trying to tell you. But these things happen. This is what our brothers did. This is what Shaka did. Age regimental system. Age graded groups of various sorts were common in the Bantu culture of the day and indeed still important in much of Africa. Age grades were responsible for a variety of activities from guarding the camp to cattle herding to certain rituals and ceremonies. Shaka organized various grades into regiments and quartered them in special military corrals with regiments having their own distinctive names and insignia. The regimental system clearly built an existing tribal cultural elements and could be adapted and shaped to fit ex expansionist agenda. See, here's the thing you got to understand. Shaka separated people by their age because they had been fighting since they were young. So if you got to the point where you're 29, 30 years old, oh, you, you're a war veteran. So he's not going to put you in a group of 14-year-olds and 10-year-olds. They, they have different duties. And, and, and the thing is, even the men who were allowed to marry had been well-worn warriors, and they were given wives at that point to reproduce. Young men were not given wives. They had to prove themselves. They actually had a dance where the young men and the young women would come together, and then they would back each other apart. This was a dance that was performed out in, every, in front of everybody and would, would allow them to orgasm. But in Shaka's camp, according to this book by E.A. Rogers, in Shaka's corral, if you got a woman pregnant, you might die. If you got a girl pregnant and you weren't authorized, you weren't old enough, you had to prove yourself, you might die. And so this is the discipline that he installed. And let's talk a little bit more about the discipline. Discipline. Shaka created ruthless determined. Shaka created ruthless determination in his army by instilling in his warriors the knowledge of what would happen if their courage failed them on in battle or their regiments were defeated. A brutal fate awaited them and their families if they did not perform well in combat. H. Ritter Haggard learned about Shaka's methods from his great nephew, the late 19th century Zulu king, Sichwayo Kumambi. As Shaka conquered a tribe, he enrolled his, its remnants in his army so that they might, in their turn, help to conquer others. He armed his regiments with short stabbing iguales. In, instead of the throwing assegai, which they had been accustomed to, and kept them subject to an iron iron discipline. If a man was observed to show the slightest hesitation about coming too close, coming to close quarters with his enemy, he was executed as soon as the fight was over. Here's the thing I want to tell you about. So there's a story in this book by E.A. Rogers 
Shaka, he said, I don't deal with the, the mixed people. Basically, they have been mixed people. He said, I don't deal with they have too much cowardice in them. They're too fearful. This is what Shaka said. I'm like, damn, you see what I'm saying? This is what Shaka said about them. He's talking about in training. If somebody showed, this is his own people. If they showed that they were afraid to get up on somebody and, and, and put that work in, he'd kill them instantly. There was no fear in Shaka's. Uh, in, 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 and your family wanted you to do the best you can because they would come back and kill you, kill the family, your grandma, your mama, your brothers and sisters, if you didn't fight like you're supposed to fight. This is what Shaka demanded of his troops. If a regiment had the misfortune of being defeated, whether by its own fault or not, it would be it, it would on return to headquarters find that the goodly proportion of the wives and children belonging to it had been beaten to death on Shaka's orders and that he was waiting their arrival to complete his vengeance by bashing their brains. This is what Shaka did. This is how he instilled. He made sure you fought. you are not going to lose. You are going to die fighting, or you're going to die fighting. Your family's going to suffer for you. So it was no cowardice allowed. The result was that was was that those Shaka's armies were occasionally annihilated. They were rarely defeated, and they never ran away. This is the this is what Shaka did to him. Shaka's methods versus the we can move on to that. Uh, let me see here. Let me see here. So basically what they're saying is Shaka was a bar, not an innovator. Basically, he looked around him and saw what were the best ideas around him. And he borrowed those ideas and he incorporated them into his military. And he, he made them the best they could be. Now, some of y'all will say, oh, well, he's not an innovator. That's beside the point. He won. That was the purpose. He won. Um, we have my good friend in here, Malika, man. What's up, man? How you doing, man? It's always good to have you back. I've never actually met Malika, but I feel like we know each other. Because you've been we, every day I've been here, you here. So I appreciate you. Anybody else who wants to join in, come on and join in. Now, the thing is, my life, I feel like black masculinity is under attack. I feel like the only uh black men that they allow us to see are Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Prince, Michael Jackson, uh Quavo. And 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 the get along cowboy. I forget that boy's name now. I forget his name. Now. I don't forgot. I'm trying to remove him from my, my little Nas X. Little Nas. I feel like that's who they want us to pattern ourselves after. Mm -hmm. See, they don't want us to pattern ourselves after Shaka, who was a disciplined man, who was an innovator, who was ruthless in his rule, who was relentless in his determination. They don't want us to pattern us ourselves after that. They don't want 22 million, 21.5 million Shaka Zulus running around the United States. Things will change immediately. Uh, do you think this is, is, am I off my rocker? Because I want you to tell me. Is this, because this is boring. This is history. Everybody hates history, uh, Malika. And uh, I, I just, I just, but I feel like we need to reach back and pull some of that black masculinity from our ancestors and inject it in ourselves. What are your thoughts on this, man? You are not off your rocker. You are definitely on your rocker. Mm -hmm. um, I learned about Shaka when I was in my teen years. Mm -hmm. And I had an argument with a person. I said, you know, one thing that they're never going to tell us in the history books that Shaka was undefeated. The Zulu warriors was undefeated. Uh, and how the way they took out British during the 1800s with mm -hmm. muskets mm -hmm. and um, firepower and gunpowder. And they say, how could that happen? I said, ingenuity. And um, when I was reading and I said, he was the progenitor of guerrilla warfare. Right. It, yeah. And also he um, he was also one of the pioneers of close quarters combat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I heard the rumors of his ferocity and his strictness. And, you know, it gets embellished. Mm -hmm. through uh, white historians. Right. But then I, I have, a, I don't have the, I don't have the book you have. I have another one. Uh -huh. And also I have a book that um, talked about the Zulu combat and the Zulu's uh, culture and stuff that I read in the book and stuff that you we talking. And it was just, and when you get older and you start getting enlightened in your understanding, um, 
and I, I had told somebody, I said, okay. And I just mentioned, I said, Apache. I said, uh, the Jaguars of Venezuela. Um, I said, the Celts. I said, the Samurai. And I said, the Zulu. I said, what they all have in common. I said, oh, they were a warrior class. I said, so we can talk about all these other people, but when we deal with the Africans, it's something different. Yeah. I said, why? I said, what is this different when the warrior class? I said, samurai was a strict warrior class too. If you the same thing, if you showed cowardice, they they, they gonna take you out. Mm -hmm. No, you could not show cowardice. Cowardice is not even mentioned in there. But Shaka was building warriors. He mm -hmm. was building warriors. Was it? Extreme, yeah, but they, but their culture was showing that it was extreme. This is what he wanted, and that's what made them effective. And also, I have to commend you when you were talking with your sons and how the way they were speaking and telling, and you were making them think, "Why do you do this? Why, why yeah. does Shaka do this?" And you're wanting them to think, and you're <laughs> you're teaching them to have the mind of a warrior. And I remember seeing on your show and with your ex-wife. You were talking, they need to know how to fight before they can learn how to read and write. And she couldn't yeah. get it. <laughs> and I remember I'm laughing. And I heard that years ago. And until I got older and I understood, and the way you broke it down, he said, okay, if somebody's gonna break in the house, just because they know how to read, recite, and understand a book, they ain't gonna defend you. Right. You know, you gotta know how to fight. You got you gotta know how to. You gotta know how to defend yourself, but also defend your home. Yes, sir. And the thing, and one of the thing, but then this is the problem we had to realize. That's masculine thinking. Mm -hmm. Feminine thinking, like how you said today. No, but that's but, not even feminine thinking because Shaka trained the women trained right along with the men. You see what I mean? Yeah. That's just that's slave thinking. Yes, that's what definitely. That's what that's slave thinking. That's that's all that is. And good brother, go ahead, go ahead, sir. But Comparing today, when you're talking about Shaka, when you're talking about uh, Abu Bakar II, mm -hmm. and even Mansa Musa, and, and you know when we even talk about, uh, you think Shaka would have been down and, and kissed the feet of the uh, Egyptian Sultan? What? what? <laughs> you think Shaka? Shaka said, "I'm passing through here with my Quran, my warriors." You, th you yeah. think Shaka would have been down and kissed the the, the foot? Of he'd that, be looking, of that. he would look, he's like, he'd be looking at you crazy. First of all, you ain't going, you have to understand something. Mm -hmm. Just his presence and his energy would be something different. Just yeah. the, just the, just the reverence of, you know, just the reverence and the energy of a warrior. Yeah. And so the story we're talking about, brothers, and see, this is why I tell you that you have to pick and choose traits mm -hmm. from men that you check the trace that you like, the trace that you loan. We talked earlier about Emperor Mansa Musa worth $4 billion, $400 billion, the richest man in the world. As he was on his Hajj, uh, he passed through Egypt and the Sultan there insisted that he come meet with them. One of the customs being, he had to bend down and kiss the Sultan's feet. Now, mind you, the Arab slave trade had been going on. They'd been running in Africa and pulling Africans out and slaving them and beating them and doing all sorts of, so they understood that these, Arabs didn't like us. They understood that they was racist as hell. We got that. They even have a name for Africans, for blacks that's synonymous with slave. I think they call it Habib or something like that. I, I bet or something like that. Akata. So he understood, huh? Akata. No, no, that's the no, South African word. It's an Arab word. I think it's Habib. But it's synonymous with black and it also means slave. You understand okay. what I'm saying? So this is how these people felt about him. He knew... So, so uh, Mansa Musa knew that he was really just trying to find a reason to attack him. Now, my Muslim brothers, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a Muslim, but it's my understanding that a Muslim, when he knows that another Muslim is on his Mecca, is on his Hajj to Mecca, mm -hmm. he is not supposed to interrupt him like that. He is not supposed to draw, try to do that to him. I don't know what you want to call it, but I know it's a bad thing if they do that. So this Sultan so upset that this rich black man is passing out all his gold and basically outshining him and everybody said, well, you're going to come to my, you gonna, I'm going to bring you to the temple and you're going to kiss my feet, black boy. I don't care how much you work. And, and Mansa Musa recognizing that this was a trap, recognizing that everybody would have died that was in his, his with him, the 60,000, 72,000 people would have died 
They'd have been slaughtered. He'd been robbed. His country would have been abandoned. He would have died. He wouldn't have been able to achieve his purpose. He went in there and eventually relented and kissed the feet of the Sultan. Now, I don't necessarily like that tactic. I understand why he did it. But my question is, would, would Shaka do it? No. No. You got to understand, warrior yeah. mind. You said something That's, soft. Yeah. Soft. Uh, yeah. Yeah, clearly. Warrior. Shaka was not soft. See, Shaka... It, Shaka was running fifty miles a day. Shaka made his 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 uh polit his his council the people that sat before. He said a very key back. word, man. Go ahead. You said a key word. Mm -hmm. Ruthless. Ruthless. Yeah. You have to understand that. First of all, like I said, just just that salt. Well, first of all, hearing and seeing how ferocious. And just the majesticness of the Zulus, that Sultan would have some fear. Yeah. You, you know, it's just, you know what it is? It's just, all right, we Gen Xers, right? Yeah. 1984 Packers and Green Bay Packers and Chicago Bears mm -hmm. um, quarter. Them dudes with towels, huge. Huge football players. The average football player back in the 70s and 80s was six foot four, weighing 280 to 300 pounds. When you see them, men, that that's 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 crippling when you see that size, the, the everything. And you see these Arab men, man, the average Arab man seeing the Zulu warrior, seeing their majesticness and seeing that strength, and you know. You dare going to tell Shaka that Shaka would come in? He would kill him. Just, just that insult enough would want to Shaka would want to go kill that man. Well, see, is is see. Here's the thing, and this is why it's important to dig into this man's psychology. He was willing that he would kill anybody who even showed fear, and then go go kill your whole family. So mm -hmm. death was not something that was a big deal to him. Mm -hmm. And as my son alluded, he knew that there was a murder attempt. He knew that they were plotting to kill him, but Shaka was not afraid of death. And a lot of that comes from what? It comes from his childhood. Yeah. And see, a lot of you brothers are likened to Shaka. And this is my whole point of talking about Shaka. This is why the story of Shaka Zulu resonates with us, not just because he was a great leader, but because of his traumatic childhood and what that did to his concept of life and death. Now, the thing is, brothers, many of you aren't afraid to die and you aren't afraid to take a person's life. But I think you have the wrong cause. You you take somebody's life because in your mind they disrespected you. They stepped on your shoe. They called you out your name. You mean they mean mugged you. That's there's a greater cause for you. You see what I'm saying? I need you to first live. That's what I need you to do. But the bottom line is, brother, Shaka is a lot like because of the traumatic childhoods that many of us as Black Americans had to endure. Many of us were beat. Many of us were picked on. Many of us were raised by our mothers in her settlements. Many of us were mistreated and neglected. Many of us were forsaken and forgotten by our fathers. This is us. You see what I'm saying? Shaka, what I'm trying to do by talking about this man is bring him home to you. Now, what did Shaka do with that? Shaka took all that anger and all that anguish, much like I did myself, and he used it as fuel to fuel himself to the top. That's what Shaka did. And so what I'm asking you brothers to do is use that anger and use that rage and turn it into gasoline and fuel yourself to the top like Shaka did. Be innovative. You see them? Shaka was fueled by the idea that he wanted revenge against his enemies. Figure out who your enemies are, brothers. It might be some anamorphous system, whatever it is. You figure out who your enemies are and you determine yourself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat this system. I'm going to empower myself. I'm going to become wealthy and powerful, not just wealthy, but also powerful. I'm going to learn how to fight, not just with my fist, but also with the pen and with my mind. You see what I'm saying? These are the things that we learn from Shaka Zulu. Although he lived a relatively short life, look at, he's left an impression. This man lived from, uh, he lived from, uh, from 1816. Let me see. Let me get from 18, from 1787 to 1828, which means Shaka died, uh, when, when he was 41 years old, but the whole world knows Shaka's name. The whole world knows Shaka. Left a legacy. He, said he left a legacy, the whole world knows him. Look what he did with his anger. You can judge Shaka just like they judge us, but you know his name, don't you? 
Malika, you know yeah. who he is. You understand what I'm saying? That was the point of bringing. This is why Shaka special. By contrast to um, uh, Abu Kari the second, who said, "Yeah, I'm rich. I don't need this money. I'm gonna go overseas." And his other ball and homeboy, Mansa Musi. Yeah, this is called need that. I'm, I'm man. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to Mecca ball. Shaka stayed home. You understand what I'm saying? Shaka stayed home and he ran the yard. You see what I mean? Shaka, Shaka stripped it down to a spear and, 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 and a shield. Now, mind you, all of this is happening. They had gold. They had all that stuff. This is 18, 1787. This is 500 years after Massa Musa. You see what I'm saying? They, they knew about all that that was going on over there. They know what you got over here. But this is what we do over here in our yard. This is how we run the yard over here. And see, what you notice is, bro, what I want y'all to notice, the Europeans didn't really go over to uh, Zululand and kidnap them and turn them into slaves, did they? Nope. Now, they nope. occupied their land, and they suppressed them, and they used other systems. But they, you don't really hear about a lot of slave ships sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, kidnapping a bunch of Zulus, and bringing them over here to, to uh, dropping them off in New Orleans, did you? You didn't hear about that, did you? Nope. But why do you think that is, Malika? Oh. Warrior class kicked that white man's ass. Right, but you see what they did to Ghana and the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Those people who were basically middle class black people. Those those cushy living black people. They, you know what? Fat soft y all, y all black soft. people. Huh? Fat soft black people. Fat soft black, just like my son said. Fat soft black people. That's what they did. But they left them kind of like the people here in America. Kind of like the black folks here in America, because they, cause, yeah. You see what I'm saying? When they run across them Zulus or people like them, i.e. Haitianos, uh -huh. them Haitians, <laughs> you see what happened? Because the Haitians did the same thing that the Zulus did. They beat the greatest nation, the greatest army in the world, laid them on their back yep. with spears and, and, and rocks and things. You understand what I'm saying? Interesting, right? Isn't this yeah. interesting? Okay. Thank you so much, man. Hang in there for a minute, King, King J. My man, King J, shout out to you. Appreciate the contribution. Uh, Tabu Smash, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys too, man. Please continue to keep contributing to the super chat and the cash out. King J, what yes, part of man. Zulu's? Or let me get the name right because I want to get this right. Sigiri Kesang Kesinzanga Akona. Okay, Sha Shaga Kinsing. I can't say the name. I'm gonna try. I'm, I need some of my South African brothers to come in here. And get this name pronunciation down. I don't want to ever disrespect our brother's name. King J, what do you think about Shaka Zulu's masculinity? Yeah, man, what you're saying, I'm gonna be honest with you, all these these uh streams you've been doing have been very powerful, man. Mm -hmm. Um I've been sending these to some people. Uh a lot of us brothers need to watch these things and see, you know, who we really are. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because I feel like we come from a like I'm gonna be honest, like I grew up seeing my um different people in my family, like you say, just have like a slave mentality. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it was inside of me. Cause I relate to what you say. Cause I grew up, my father was addicted to drugs. You know, sometimes I come home, PlayStation's gone, whatever. Cause he pawned it to sell crack or whatever. I used to be, just have like a rage. Just, I wanted to just destroy listen to the me. World. Listen to me. But, I have that. I had that rage too, brother. Yeah. And but see, I, that's I like why I learned a lot of you guys. Channel. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, bro. I learned how to channel that, mm -hmm. and instead of doing something negative, focus towards how can I build my. So the best way, like success, is the best re revenge. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? The best revenge you could possibly get is to live a fantastic life. Well, Despite let me let me let me help you out because I'm I'm, I'm 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 you know I've, I've written my books, rules to live by, how to maintain peace of mind and happiness, just for black men, just like yourself, because I was filled with that rage too. You understand? I would go so far as to say I was filled with hate, and I used yeah. my hate to fuel me. Now, it got me to a certain point. It got me to about, I guess, 34, 35 years old, but the, the problem with hate is that even though it, it works great as a gasoline, it will propel you into success, it will eventually kill you, which is what happened to our brother Shaka, which is another thing I wanted to talk about. Shaka did not pivot. You see what I'm saying? Shaka was still living in his past. He was still seeking vengeance well past that time. There was no forgiveness in Shaka, in, in King Shaka. There was no and forgiveness. Can I just add one brother. thing? 
because he I reminds like me. Finish. I would like to finish. Oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and, and so because of that, it began to eat him up like a cancer, and the people around him basically killed him because it became too much. I understand, Shock. And what you have to do as a man, again, what I'm telling you, brothers, none of our leaders were imperfect. None of You take the characteristics that you need at the time you need them, and then you put it back. You see, Shaka was ruthless because he had to be. But there's a time when you have to be cautious and you have to be loving and you have to be patient. Shaka did what he had to do, but Shaka went a he went too far. You see, he was he went too far. Uh, and, and so that's the lesson that we also want to learn from Shaka. But go ahead, King J. What were you trying to say before? No, I was just going to say his, his story. Uh, it sounds a lot like almost like Tupac. Kind of like I just see sort of like an overlap and just that, that like that mind frame can lead you to do certain things where if you don't learn how to how to channel it right and how to how to I guess get fueled by more productive things in your life, it can lead you, you know, down a negative path. At the maybe end one day. day I'll I'll tell you guys about Tupac. Tupac was a performer. Tupac knew mm -hmm. exactly what he was doing. He went to a performing high school in New York. He then moved to Oakland. It, 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 he was a performer. He's a great performer. You see, he was a great he would have been a great actor. He'd have been probably on the lines of a Denzel Washington or somewhere comparable at that point. But don't confuse Tupac Sh Shakur, the singer actor, with the great King Shaka Zulu. You understand what I'm saying? Don't those are that's like comparing. I mean, he's an actor compared to this great historical. You got the real deal right here, brother. Yeah, I you feel what I'm saying? this is the real deal right here. This is King Shaka. But what I want you to do is understand that. Shaka had to deal with a lot that we also had to deal with. Again, as I said before, um, um, Shaka was angry because of what he had to endure, the disrespect that he, he dealt with as a child, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, in his mind, uh, you know, abandoned by his father. He was rightful. He lost his birthright. You see what I'm saying? He he was forced to live with his mother and spurned as a bastard child, like many of us. This is what I'm telling. This is what fueled him. This is a very similar story that many of us had to do, fellas. You see, and what I'm telling you is, Shaka took it and he did. He did. He took. He made the best out of the situation. Yes, it made him ruthless, but he turned that ruthless and ruthlessness into an advantage. He turned it into an attribute. You understand? But the problem is, he didn't turn it off. Some of you brothers are right there. It's to the point where it's destructive to you. And that's why he died short at 41 years old. Yes, we know him. And yes, there's a time when you want to channel that channel that inner shock. And then there's also a time when you want to channel that uh, Mansa Musa and you want to channel that uh, uh, Abu Kari the second. But these are just attributes of masculinity, attributes of manhood that you can pick and choose and use when you need. You understand what I'm you, you understand the importance of this because and you can't be Shaka. You can't be Mansa Musa. You can't be Abu Kar. Those men were already their men, but you are, you are a composition of the men that you encounter in your life. You're a composition of them. You pick and choose those characteristics. I'm simply asking you to also incorporate our great leaders, you see, because we don't have them. You'll, you'll talk about a, 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 a you, you, young King J. You'll talk about, you will talk about a Tupac Shakur and speak his name in the same breath as as a King Shaka Zulu, which to me is like, oh my God, that's like the difference between a bumblebee and an elephant. One is a great majestic, you know, it's you, there's no comparison. You understand? But because in your mind, that's what you've been given. But you have Shaka now, King J. You understand what I'm saying? Even yeah. even, even Tupac would tell you, no, nah, man, Shaka got me beat, baby. If you know yeah. Tupac like we do. But go ahead and then I'm gonna let Chaos Reign proceed. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and that's why I think these streams that you're doing are so important. Because, like, like you said, no, you're the first person I really hear to even talk about these people like this. Yeah. You know what I mean? They don't tell you this in history class. They don't see. You not really see this on a history channel. You don't see this information. They, so, you know, they, this they is do. just really significant what you're doing. They do, brother, but they don't talk about him like he's alive right now, and so yeah. he's dead to you. All we're doing now is speaking about our great ancestors. And when you speak about your ancestors, man, I, I promise you, they come back to you. They will, they are real. They will reappear to you in in some form or another. You understand what I'm saying? Don't let you know, them bury your ancestors like that. And when they do present an ancestor, and there's something don't sound right about that, 
then it's on you, it's incumbent upon you to dig deeper and learn the true history of this man. Joe learn it like the same thing with Mansa Musa. We didn't know all the details about Mansa Musa. We didn't know about they barely talk about Abu Kari the second. You don't even hear about this black man who took three thousand ships and, and ended up in Trinidad and went up to, to to Brazil and ended up in the Dominican Republic. Them are all our favorite spots. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so you don't hear about that. But all I'm doing, the, the bottom line is they don't have any reason to. Why would they tell you about all these great men, King Jay? They don't want to. They tell you, oh, yeah, you Negroes are descended from kings. Right, right, right. We get it. But they don't give you names. They don't give you specifics. They, you got your own suit. So I'm going to talk to you brothers in the next couple of days about a black man that was considered the Black Panther of his time. Matter of fact, it was so bad, the Portuguese thought he had superpowers, the way he whooped on them like that. And we, I'm gonna bring, we're gonna make him come alive to you. You understand what I'm saying? Shaka Zulu should be right up there with Abu Kari II, uh, uh, Mansa Musa, Martin Luther King, uh, Frederick Dell. You, you, let's not just talk about the, the the ones over here who got caught and were the descendant of enslaved Africans. Let's talk about the 80,000 years before we got here. Let's talk about the last 8,000 years of, of what our black brothers did. You understand what I'm saying, King J? Let's bring that, let's make that alive. Because see, history is alive as long as you're talking about it. Your ancestors are here as long as you're talking about it. Does that make sense to you, brother? Because we we might have to talk about that too in a more philosophical uh, 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 conversation. But the bottom line is, man, this, this is some this is this is this is one of our, this is somebody that we should never forget. You understand, bro? Yeah, that's a fact. And not just talking about the history, but actually understanding the, the, the mind frame. Yes, sir. You know, understand how you can incorporate that in your life and use that to fuel yourself and we can build ourselves back up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly how they did. Everything that they did, we could do that today in an economic sense in the modern society. I'm gonna ask you another question. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you another question. We're gonna go to chaos rain. What do you think about would you like to have the level of discipline that Shaka had? Yeah, absolutely. I, I try to keep myself disciplined. You know, I go to the gym every day. I went to the gym this morning, you know, but I could always do more. Like you said, he's running 50 miles and doing this. So, you know, yeah, Man, absolutely. Shaka was running 50 miles at 30 plus years old, bro. Yeah. Yeah. That's Shaka was running 50 miles at 30 plus years old, man. Don't you think Shaka had aches and pains and stuff? Yeah. I mean, Shaka he just still goes got right up through. and ran 50. Not only did he, he made everybody else run 50 miles. Right, yeah. But that's he was still out front. He was still out front fighting the wars at that yeah, age. He, he led by example. You know, right. I mean, that's another thing. You, know? you got to love that, man. So that's a lesson that you can learn, young brother. Lead by, it's, it's something to pick up, man. Something to learn. These are your, these should be your heroes. But uh, anyway, black man, let me uh, move on to Chaos Reign. Chaos Reign, it's always good to have you in here. And R. Alexis, I know you've been hanging in there. Shout out to Greg O. He said, Ashante Kwa, someone la Histera. Okay, cool. John Gilly, thank you, Uncle. You guys appreciate what we're doing here. Make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. Chaos Rain, we're talking about Shaka Zulu. What attributes of Shaka's character, based on the reading and what we've seen, uh, what name some of the attributes of his character as a man? Um, Resilient. Um very dedicated to dedicated. his craft mm -hmm. as a as a war general mm -hmm. um i think one thing with him is he is uncompromised you get oh, me? yeah mm -hmm. and very much a dictator in a very good way um mm -hmm. one question um what year he was born in the September's? what year again shock was born in 1787 Okay, all right. That's what I want to make sure. Okay, July. Good. It says July twenty second, seventeen eighty seven. Okay, so he he was born a century early for Marcus Garvey, the next century. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and you know it's funny. A lot of the war warrior type men come out. If I really follow the timeline, come around the eight around the eighties, like each one like seventeen eighty, eighteen eighty, or so on. I find it very interesting. Now I think about that. Something about the mm -hmm. eight is very intriguing. What other what other attribute? What do you think drove Shaka Zulu? I think what drove him, to be honest with you, is to be um 
I don't know if I want to say accept it, but I think it drove him to be to be remembered. Because I think if we, I remember watching the movies of him, besides reading the literature of him, that he was always a boy that was, if that the story is right, that you know his mother was not accepted into the the kingdom, and so he was like a what do you call the word? It's an underdog, you know. Who does he remind says, you of? Who does he? What personality does he remind you of? The current personality. Oh damn, Dennis, that's a hard question. I gotta think deep. Right there in your face. Uncle D. Somebody that's not accepted by the in crowd, mm -hmm. who, who bullies his way in, mm -hmm. who maintains power with ruthlessness and by any means necessary, who punishes oh, his enemies. Oh, huh? you remind me of Malcolm X. No. 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 Oh. Okay. He punishes his enemies. He's ruthless. Okay. He used everything out of his, his. Who does he remind you of? I don't know if it's one of older. Either you I, love him or you hate him. Who does he remind you of? Damn, I wonder if it's the. Um, Some people call him evil. Some people call him a great leader. Who do you? Rem who does he remind you of, brother? Who he is, I remember. Damn. Somebody huh. got it. Huh? Not not Trump. Somebody put Trump. That's not Yeah, Trump. Trump. Really? Trump was a descendant of German, uh, I mean, German background. His father was a gambler. He's looked down upon by the other rich elite in, in New York. He's always finding himself having to prove himself. Bloomfield, Bloomberg, they never accepted him. They call him a charlatan. You see what I'm saying? You either love him or hate him. There's no in between. He's ruthless. He's hated by many. You understand what I'm saying? He oh, rose okay. to the highest height of power. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. I think I follow you. I follow you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> so in my book, uh, Rules to Live By, How to Maintain Peace of Mind and Happiness, I have a section called uh, The King's Eye View. And it's specifically in this yellow book right here. When I refer when I refer to the things that kings understand that the regular person doesn't, and also I talk about the gods I view, the thing that God sees that you guys don't see. I really hope you guys check the book out, man. It, it, those of you who have it's a very deep intellectual and philosophical book that goes deep into conflict. Uh, yeah, I know it's just me, and you guys don't respect me like that. But I promise you, in 150 years, people will be looking at this book and saying, oh, my God, this, this man was touched by God when he wrote this book. This is amazing. Like, he was ahead of his time. I would hope that my black brothers would be the first ones that's up on that and say, yeah, my great granddaddy used to tell me about uh, Mr. Sperling's book. But the bottom line is I explain here that Trump, and this is before he actually came to office because I was finished writing the book in 2015, but knowing history and knowing enough about that particular personality type. You guys can get the book if you go to uh, Amazon or you can send, if you want a hard autograph, hard copy, sperlingdennis at gmail.com. Just hit me up and uh, pay $54.99 and I get all three books to you. But the bottom line is, I said in my, my book that Trump has the possibility of he will he's hated, but he he's also loved. He has the possibility of being one of the greatest uh, presidents. And history will bear that out. By contrast, somebody like Barack Obama, who never stood a, a he never actually comp accomplished, uh, he never vanquished his foe. His foe being that all white uh, Congress that he could never quite get around. He always uses that as his excuse. That was his foe. That was his antagonist. And so he never vanquished his antagonist. Trump, on the other hand, he vanquished the justice system the FBI, the CIA, the press, uh, the whole Democratic Party, and the Republicans, he punked them all. You see what I'm saying? They were all afraid of him. And they still are afraid of him to the point that they have tried to take the outlandish step of, and I'm not, I didn't vote for Trump the first time, but they've taken an outstand, outlandish step of trying to uh, uh, make sure he can never run for president again by impeaching him after he's left office. This is how afraid, that's like trying to kill a man twice. This is what they, this is, they, they have the same fear 
of of this man, this Trump man, as they did Shaka, they were they feared him. I'm not saying they respected him, but they feared him. And the way he took power, he killed the legitimate heir of the party. He killed the legitimate heir to the throne, Shaka Zulu did. His brother, who was his son, his father's legitimate son. This is how ruthless he was. And Trump is the same level of ruthlessness. And so record, just see the personality for what it is. The reason why a lot of you black men secretly like Trump, even though you didn't vote for him, maybe you didn't vote at all, you like that ruthlessness. And it's okay. You can tell Uncle D, I understand. I, res I, I, I can appreciate it, you know, from a historical standpoint. I, I've seen men like this before throughout history. Every now and then I have to use that level of ruthlessness too. I just know how to turn it off, which is what I'm trying to get you guys to do. Shaka never turned his ruthlessness off and it began to be his demise. This is what I'm trying to tell you guys. So yes, there's a time to be ruthless, but then there's a time to, to, to be peaceful like a dove. This is what I'm asking you guys to do. Um, Brother Chaos, right? What else you want to add to this thing, brother? But did you do you see my point? Do you see the Kendrick spirit <laughs> there? You know, do you see that? Yeah, I do think you, I follow you. Do you see the ruthlessness that they share? Go I, ahead. I follow you, but that's what it takes to make change. You got to be aggressive and ruthlessness in anything you do. And I think with this country and this administration, you know, they took precautions yeah. to- what? One thing, okay. chaos. Jesse Bell, I appreciate the five dollar. He said, "Don't sleep on West Africa, bro." The Ashanti president day Ghana had four wars with the British from 1823 to 1895. They only lost the final war, not 1895. See, the thing is, Jesse Shaka didn't lose any wars. Yeah, we only remember victories, yeah. not loss. Yeah, they didn't lose any wars. That's the difference between Shaka. Shaka, if you if you lost, your whole family died. You might have mm. got annihilated. You might have been annihilated, but you did not lose. You see what I'm saying? You see the difference between that? See, they they sued the, 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 our brothers on the West Africa. They sued for peace. They were just fighting for peace. You see, Fight, Shaka was fighting for life and death. Either we're going to live or we're going to die. But we're not going to lose. This is the mentality that he had. This is like when you put your son Sue talks about it like this. When you put your army on death ground. There's nowhere to run. Either you are going to fight and you're going to win or you're going to die. That is what Sun Tzu referred to as death ground. And when you do that, you have some of the most ferocious wars or fights or battles that have ever existed on this planet. That's the difference, Jesse. So I appreciate your input and thank you for the $5 super chat. Please also read Sun Tzu. Uh, go ahead, Chaos. Yeah, so the only thing I would say, um this is a very good history background. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was one time I was gonna buy one book that referenced Shaka, but I never got a chance. But maybe I go back to the replay this, I'll find the books that you reference. And I think most black people, men especially of any age, should understand the war tactics our ancestors left before us that dealt with um, people, not just other black men, but just men in general. Because mm -hmm. let's be honest, other groups of men study us. That's then your tactics. That's how they stay on top. You not get around it. Yeah. And just for, and just for you all to understand, uh, this is the Zulu Empire here. This is what they call South Africa. You know, these are some of the. Uh, this is this is the Zulu Empire here. And you guys may not realize how huge Africa is. But this is huge here. So and they ran that. You know they they. <laughs> And Shaka pretty much fought everybody that ran up. They didn't. They didn't want none of that though. Uh, thank you, Chaos Brian. If you guys appreciate what we're doing, make sure you contribute to the super chat, the Cash App, and the Pay uh, PayPal. Uh, let me see here. I want to make sure I get everybody who contributed to the Cash App. I want to give a real big shout out to uh, Chris York. Thank you, Chris John. Chris John again. Chris John, my man Patrick. I don't know who Patrick didn't give, give his last name, but he said. He sent this earlier, 743, he said, for the good history lesson, brother, he sent $100. And I appreciate that. That really, you man, you know, I had to show my sons that I said, look how much, because, you know, I was hesitant about doing this chaos, right? And we're going to go to our Alexis. I'm thinking, man, they don't want to talk about this. They don't want to hear about this. This is not interesting to brothers. Brothers want to talk about how to get rich. You know, they want to talk about SYSBM vacation, going to the DR, going to Columbia. That's what they want to talk about, chaos. They don't want to. They don't want to hear about Shaka Zulu. They don't want to hear about King Shaka. They don't want to hear about 
uh, uh, Mansa Musa. They don't want to hear about these. But see, I'm I'm surprised at what you guys are getting. You know, they y'all want to hear me go back and forth with an ex porn star blaming black men for the divorce rate chaos, right? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? They y'all y'all don't want to hear about King Hannibal or uh, General Hannibal, y'all. But but apparently uh, apparently I was wrong, even in being right. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, chaos? Because I was wrong in what I assumed, but I was right for proceeding forward and and, and trying to break bring these these great black men, generals, kings. Uh, chieftains back to life for you. What are your thoughts on that? And then we're going to move on to our Alexis. Is this something that you enjoy? Have you, have you picked up something that like, wow. Okay. Is it, is, is King Shaka alive to you now? Chaos, right? Got to unmute myself. Hey, chaos. Are you chaos? You still there? All right. Well, we're going to have to go to our Alexis. Unmute yourself, fellas. If you can hear me, unmute yourself. Our Alexis. How are you? Did you? Did you hear the question I directed at Chaos Reign? Is this are these heroes? Are these black men now coming alive to you? To speak one's to speak one's name is to make them live again. So yes, I so say again, I say. with with uh, with Shaka, as great as he is, show me a man's greatest weak strength, and I'll show you his greatest weakness. His hatred, Talk to me. he let it consume, yes. uh -huh. let it consume him, and ultimately it destroyed him. Yeah, it's not his fault per se because of his upbringing, and unfortunately, it is his fault, brother. It is his fault, and let me tell you why it's his fault. You cannot right. control the circumstances in which you were born and what you have to deal with, but you are still responsible to work yourself out of that. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, you are still responsible. So a lot of us black men were born. We didn't have the father we wanted or we didn't have a father around. We didn't have the mother we wanted or we didn't have the mother around. Many of us were poor. We grew up in poor southern country communities or poor, violent uh, 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 city communities. We couldn't control that. But we're still responsible for our life, our Alexis. We're still responsible right. for removing ourselves from those circumstances in the better circumstances. Who am I? Or Alexis, to tell my sons who I love so much that, well, you know, daddy was born in the ghetto with no mom, uh, uh, no dad around, uh, and a mom who was working or couldn't be there like I wanted to be there, uh, uh, violence in the community, violence in the home, extended family. Since I was born like that, I just stayed this way because this is how I was born and this is how it is. And you now you stuck in it too. Who am I to tell my sons I didn't try to change my circumstances? You understand what I mean, brother? You are responsible. Yes, See, Shaka recognized that he was responsible for escaping his circumstances and changing the course of his life and going from a bastard son of a wayward prince to the king of all Zulu land and one of the most feared men in, in, the, southern, in, in the world, actually. He was responsible for that. You understand what I mean? But, yes. but 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 he 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 also allowed it yes. to consume him that hate. So you were on the right cup, but I don't want the brothers to think, oh, I was born like this, so I'm stuck. Right, we can't <laughs> have that. You were you are the gods of your universe, yeah. black man. You are you speaking into existence, and this shall I be. You. No, 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 brother. It was everybody was thinking the same thing. You just presented an opportunity for me to give you a bit of my wisdom. That's why they call me <laughs> Uncle D. I'm talking to you from a place of love, because whatever is happening, thank you. Hey, hey, man. It's happened to all of us, man. And I could have sat back and said, well, this is how life is and felt, oh, well. Or I could have said, no, nah, I'm going to become a lawyer. I'm going to have TV shows. I'm going to have a fine woman. I'm going to travel around the world, ride around in nice cars. My kids going to live better than I ever thought I could. Even if I talk country and, you know, I chop my words up and I speak Ebonics, they'll be better off for me. And I'm going to sit back and enjoy it. And whatever I have to do, I'm going to do it, despite my limitations of how I was raised. You understand what I'm saying, our Alexis, brother? Absolutely. You got you Absolutely. use that will of Shaka Zulu. You use that self-discipline and you discipline the people around you. One thing about me, man, you know, and I'm talking to you from a place of love. I love you. I love all you brothers. And the fact that you are spending this time with me on a Saturday night having this conversation, it shows me that, you know, the most high is with us and our ancestors are with us. And then you guys realize I could be upstairs watching a movie with my sons, but I'm spending this valuable time with you guys because I know this is this is my purpose. You see, but but I say all that to say, man, um, 
we we we, we are all we have, and you are all you have. Does that make sense? And and you you may not be able to control the circumstances. None of us can. We can't control the circumstances that we're in, uh, how we were born. But goddamn it, we can use by the by the will of our own by our own will. We change them. That's what men do. That's what gods do. Bible says this. The Christian Bible says, "You are all gods." That's a very rarely cited passage. You are all God. But what does that mean? It doesn't spell it with a big G. It spells it with a little G. What it means is your universe is everything you can conceive, touch, and be around. And just like the Most High God spoke into existence the universe, you can speak into existence the circumstances in which you want to live and exist in. Does that make sense, our Alexis? Absolutely. You're the master of your own destiny. And like you said, you are responsible for your actions. So what Shaka didn't learn is that he needed to throw on different hats depending yeah. on his life circumstances. Mm-hmm. So when you're man, when there's a time to be Mansa Musa and there's a time to be Abu Bukhari and there's a time to be um, George Washington Carver and be a scientist, mm-hmm. there's, there are all different aspects of it, but you must learn them. Just like you learn how to fight and be a warrior, that's the basic and the foundation of all men is human survival. Mm-hmm. You have to learn the other steps. They're building blocks and foundations, but your yeah. survival is the is is paramount. Amen. All right, yeah, man, that's exactly right. And, and so, woo, that's a beautiful lesson. Thank you so much, our Alexis, Jesse Vale the third. Thank you for coming in, brother. I appreciate you. Shout out to John Guillory. I appreciate the uh, the cash app. He said, uh, Dennis, these are the stories we want and we need to hear and talk about. I heard these Black Kings names before, but never got this deep in the history. But, I bet this is the first time we've had 62 black men talk about Shaka Zulu all at once. <laughs> you know, since Shaka passed. Maybe when the movie came out, but nobody, they weren't talking about this man's dynamic personality. But but as we talk about our ancestors, they 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 live with us. They'll they they're here. We we're we're making them live again. So, you know, I, I think this is important. L Steven wants to know my cash app. The cash app is right here on the board. Uh, Cash App is right there. If you want to contribute, there it is right there. I appreciate all your contribution. Jesse Vale the third. thank you so much for coming in. Uh, This is the point you put up. One last point, much respect to Shaka Zulu, but Shaka Zulu never actually fought against any Europeans. All of his wars were against other Africans. Uh, Go ahead and elaborate on that, brother, and I'm going to share a bit of information with you after you finish. Go ahead, sir. Unmute yourself. Uh, Jesse? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Shaka, Shaka Zulu never engaged in any major conflicts with Europeans. Like through most of his mm-hmm. life, he actually used a lot of diplomacy with uh, certain European groups. But I also mm-hmm. wanted to say one thing. You know, you touched a lot on Shaka Zulu, but one thing I don't hear people mention enough is that one of the biggest things that Shaka Zulu did was that he united the Zulu people. And that actually helped him after his death to be able to better uh, to be to be able to fight better against the Europeans. Because now how did he how did he go about uniting them? What did he do? Well, it was through diplo- d- diplomacy. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it was through just conquering them. Uh, and then I mean, what, he, he what, used a lot of different did, methods. Well, what options did he present to the people after he conquered? Them? Well, um, so I know I know that it was join me or die. Yeah, that was that was basically yeah. that was we, basically we meant, a lot of times. Oh, yeah, some, we mentioned I mean, that, we mentioned that did, earlier. We mentioned that earlier. Sometimes he did uh, have certain. Let's say if they had certain Zulu groups that may have been larger than his, he would he would go through diplomacy. Um, so he did have some chiefs that it was like okay. You know, if you join me, I'll give you this. I'll join me, I'll give you that. But a lot of the smaller groups, it was through conquering and warfare. And, and and that's very important because if you look at any people, any empires, you have to bring these people together. If you look at the Europeans, the Asians, there's always somebody that comes like a Shaka Zulu that helps to bring all of these people together under one force. And that's a that's another reason why Africans were actually able to resist the Europeans a lot better than the indigenous peoples in Americas because they didn't have these large empires that were connected together that were unified 
like some of the African groups. Okay, so I want to I want to I want to challenge you on something because you're right, uh, but you're also I want to put it in context. Okay, you you said that earlier. You said Shaka never actually had a head up conflict with the any European powers. You said that I agree with that. Now there is an argument that he was on his way to invade the Cape when he was assassinated. Right? You familiar mm -hmm. with that? But, yeah. And his brother's like, no, nah, no, nah, hell no. Nah. We're killing you first, right? He couldn't turn it off, but he was learning about them. Now, on the other hand, there's a battle of is is uh, this is the name, brothers? Is battle of is uh, Say it. Who can say that? Say somebody. Say the name. Anybody? Say the name. Anybody? Help me out. Is Lawana? Is that it? Is yeah, Lawana. Okay. All right. Isandawana. Isandawana. So this was a battle that happened in 1879. As we know, Shaka had been dead at this point for maybe 50 years, more or less. But Shaka's battle tactics were still in place. In this battle, which took place on January 22nd, 1879, the British armed empire made plans to invade the Zulu kingdom. OK, now I'm just, pre, you know, quickly rolling through this thing. The leader at the time was this black man here and I believe they have this was the this was the uh this was the commander in chief of the British forces in the Cape. This was the black Siswayo was the commander or he was the king of the Zulus at the time. Basically they decided they were going to invade. And so what happened? He went out and they end up slaughtering the entire British army down to a few men and a dog. All right, this is what happened. Um, I want you guys to check this out, but it was using that same bull tactic. The force they use the same tactic that Shaka had instilled. They use the same acid, the same spears. So I'm going to put this link here. There's a movie made famous about this battle called Zulu Dawn. You can watch it for free on YouTube. It's called Zulu Dawn. So get your Bluetooth together. Tap that button, get it playing on your big TV. I promise you, it's even better than uh, Shaka Zulu because you actually get to see in part of the movie, what they do is they play espionage. A couple of the Zulus allow themselves to be caught and they give the, the British military wrong information. The British military, it confirms what they think has happened, i.e. Uh, shock uh, that the Zulu MP, the Zulu military, the bulk of them are coming from one direction when really they're coming from another direction. And so all through, and they, they want, they're running miles and miles and miles. So eventually they just end up wiping out the entire Zulu and wiping out the entire uh, uh, British army that came there to invade. So let's read this part. Uh, the Zulu army was commanded by Isa Princess Niswayo and uh, Nitulu and Indume, half brother of Sitswayo, the command, the, the, the command that and Sitswayo is the chief commanded the UP corps after uh, Kamapla. I'm messing these names up, man. I'm, I, I, I apologize. The regular Inkushi or commander was wounded while Shelmsford was in the field seeking them. The entire Zulu army had outmaneuvered him, moving behind his force with the intention of attacking the British army on the 23rd. Pauline had received reports of a large forces of Zulus throughout the morning of 22nd from 8 a.m. on. Vendettas had basically, they had forces over here for they didn't know where these Zulus were coming from. People, the scouts, they over here. No, they over here. It was just so much bad intel, they confused. The Vendettis had observed Zulus on the hills to the left front. And the, they had, I mean, they had people from India there working. They had some, some Africans on their side. They thought they was going to go in and, and, and wear them out. Didn't work. Uh, while he was at the camp, observed a large force of several thousand Zulu moving to the British left around the hill of Islanda. Pauline sent word to Chimsford, which was received by the general between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. The main Zulu force was discovered at 11 a.m. by Lieutenant Charles Rawls' troops and scouts, who chased a number of Zulus into a valley, only to only only then seeing 20,000 men of the main enemy force sitting totally quiet. In other words, they would sit 20,000 men sitting absolutely quiet on the other side of a hill that close and didn't know it. This valley was generally 
this valley has generally been thought to be uh, the Niguisa, some seven miles from the British camp, but may have been even been closer in the area of the Spurs uh, Nigunde Hill. Having been discovered, the Zulu force leapt to the offense. Raw's men began fighting, retreat back to the camp, and a messenger was sent to warn Pauline. The Zulu attack then developed in a traditional horns of the chest and the buffalo. This is the same thing that Shaka talked about. This is the important part. So even though Brother Jesse is saying Shaka never actually engaged, the military tactic that he inflated, he inputted was used to destroy this, this. So it's just like he was there too. Shaka was there in memory and spirit and in physical force. Uh, the chest of the buffalo with the aim of encircling the British position. From Pauline's vantage point in the camp at the at first, only the right horn and then the chest center of the attack seemed to be developing. Pauline sent out first one, then all six companies of the 24th foot into an extended firing line. So they lined up one after the other one. They got to reload. You okay? And you got, you got 20,000 Zulus rushing you. That didn't work out very well. But either way, Pauline sent out the first and then all six companies of the 24th foot into the extended firing line with the aim of meet, meeting the Zulu attack head on and checking it with firepower. They thought they was going to stop them. Remember, you, they, they counted on people turning and running after they got shot. The man in front of you dies. After a while, you're like, oh, my God, I don't want to die. Zulus kept coming. Remember, if you die, if, if, if you return, if you, if you cowered away, you might die and your whole family is going to die. So you're going to die anyway. You have no choice. You're on, as, as, as Sun Tzu said, you're on death ground. Dunford's men, upon meeting elements of the Zulu center, and the, it retreated to Dunga, a, a dried out water course on the British right flank where they formed a defensive line, the rocket battery. They had missiles, that's what they mean, rocket battery. Under Dumont's command, which was not mounted and dropped behind the rest of the force, was isolated and overrun. They overran all that very early in the engagement. Two battalions of native troops. They had natives there, they had Africans, mother, they had everybody. The two battalions of native troops we're in the Dumford's line. While all the officers in the NCOs, non-commissioned officers, carry rifles, only one in 10 of the ranks had firearms of those few weapons. So they gave all the black natives, they gave them some old busted fire. Only one in 10 of them had a, a firearm. So they basically sent them out there to get, to be to be fodder for those Zulu warriors. Basically a living wall that the Zulus would eventually work through. Uh, many of the native troops began to leave the battlefield at this point. They knew them Zulus. They didn't want none of that. They just ran up out of it. We're going to take your money, but we're going to leave as soon as we can. Pauline only made one change to the original disposition after about 20 minutes of firing, bringing in the companies and the firing line slightly closer to the camp. This is a picture. Okay, so we're just going to get down to it. Um, an officer in an advantage in advance of Chelmsworth force gave this eyewitness account of the final stage of the battle at 3 p.m. So from 11 p.m. to 3 p.m. is when they fall. In a few seconds, we distinctly saw the guns fire again, one after the other sharp. This was done several times, pause and then flash and flash. The sun was shining on the camp at the time and then the camp looked dark, just as if a shadow was passed over. The guns did not fire after that. In a few minutes, all the tents had disappeared. So basically what they're telling you, Black brothers, is that it was like a Black wave of Zulus was just overran the whole camp. The tents went down, the gunfire stopped. They just overran the whole British army that came down there. Nearly the same moment as described in Zulu Warriors account. The sun turned black in the middle of the battle. We could see it, it over us or should have thought we have, had been fighting till evening. Then we got into the camp and there was a great deal of smoke and fire. Afterwards, the sun came out. They brought it. They just literally just, uh, <laughs> they said this, they said this, this, there was a solar eclipse at the same time, but they had overrun these people, man. They had just overrun them. So let's get down to the, of the eight, eight, 800, 1800 plus force of British troops and African auxiliaries, over 1300 were killed. Okay, most of them Europeans, including field commanders Pauline and Dunkel. Only five Imperial officers survived, and 52 officers uh, lost was the most lost by any British battalion up to that time. Amongst those killed was the Surgeon Major Peter Shepard, 
of first they killed everybody. Okay, this is what happened. And this is this beautiful strip of land is where this 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 happened, folks. So um, you know, th this is this is definitely Shaka's doing, Jesse. You understand what I'm saying? This is Shaka's tactic right here. You see what I'm saying, brother? Jesse, you still there? Oh yeah, my bad. I was yeah, I so, understand what you're saying. So this yeah, is so even though Brother Shaka died at 41 at the hands of his half brothers, his tactics were still there. So they worked. They proved if the if the point is that Shaka was never actually tested against the European during his lifetime, true. But the tactics that he imposed, the military training, the discipline he imposed on his people, which was taken over by this general, they worked. They proved themselves work. Now eventually. It got to a point that they had to super peace because, you know, it, at, at the end of the day, if you got people fighting with hands and spears and these folks got these machine guns and whatnot, remember the point of the Zulu empire was so that they could continue far. Remember the Zulu warriors were more of a militia. They were called up when necessary. They were all trained in war, but they were called up when necessary. They weren't, it wasn't like it was a standing army, but they were all ready to die for their kingdom so they could do what? farm, feed their families, those sort of things. But uh, anyway, Jesse, what else would you like to add to this conversation? Yeah, man, I, I would probably just add, you know, definitely look into the overall history because it's, it's interesting, man. Like uh, the battle that you just talked about, uh, the, the king at the time was actually Shaka's half nephew, which the, uh, one of the, they only had, two brothers of shakas that uh no three brothers of shakas that survived because they actually shaka wasn't the only brother that was killed you, they killed uh -huh. they killed five they killed five other brothers but one of the three brothers that survived the king in that battle that you just talked about was actually uh his son so it's a it's a real interesting history man the well, Zulu was definitely that. ruthless overall yeah i appreciate that but i think as to the point of whether or not shock if we were asking the question whether or not shakas uh tactics would work i think we would have to answer yes based on uh even though he never got a chance he never fought the europeans directly and mind mm -hmm. you the british empire at the time was the most powerful force in the world if we look at right. the battle of Iswal Iswalanda, is while is 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 alanda we have to say that shaka's tactics proved successful his discipline is not just well, his tactics, to be, but to his be training worked you. I, I I don't know if his tactics would have worked. I mean, it it worked in a battle. It did work. That's, that's the thing what according about, to this historical the document, they worked. Oh, according I'm to oh. this historical account, they worked. No, what I what I'm saying is it worked in that particular battle, but I don't mm. know if those tactics could have been sustained over a long war. And that's the thing about that's the thing about well, he wiped uh, he wiped out the whole army, so they wasn't gonna have a war. It was all in one battle. He he convinced them. To be here, he they thought they were there. They thought they were. He wiped out all the little. He convinced them into one big. That was the whole point. I'm gonna get that. We gonna because if you look at if you read the reading of this, he basically said we got a farm. Our people have to eat, so we're gonna have to make this one decisive battle. We don't have time for all these skirmishes, them hitting and running. So he suckered them into thinking that they were going. This is gonna be a he suckered the Europeans into thinking. That they were gonna beat this man. This is this this black man right here. Let me put his picture up so you'll know who we're dealing with. This black man right here, right, suckered the European, this well-trained European, uh, 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 English British officer into thinking that he was gonna be able to wipe these Zulus out in one fell swoop, and he failed. So the war ended right there. There was well, no battle. There was the one decisive battle that ended the war. Well, the reason I say that is because in that particular battle, the British only lost about eighteen hundred troops. That's all you know they said. You're right. That's why. That's why I say it in terms but, of war. But, but here's what you got to understand: they said eighteen heavily armed troops with gun and rockets and 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 and, 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 and weapons and and rock. They had all of that, and they lost. Right. And yeah. So so my thing is. I mean, how many troops do you need? How many troops do you need? How do you need eighteen hundred police to control a crowd of twenty thousand? Do you need eighteen hundred police officers to control a crowd 
of, of 1,800 well-armed police officers to control a crowd of 20,000 people. Let me give you yeah, an easier probably. question. Let me give you an easy yeah. question. Can, can two police officers control a crowd of 20 people? Yeah, sure, sure. Right. So 1,800 should have did it. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I get what if you're saying. By, if you're going by those European, oh, we these are people out here with sticks and spears. We're gonna send them out here with right. rockets and guns. And it failed, brother. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It oh, failed yeah, because I, of the sheer will of the Zulu people willing to die fighting as opposed to <laughs> losing. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. But I just don't. I just agree with. The only thing I don't agree with is I don't think that that would but, have worked. In in more conflicts, but it like but I, it did work. I agree that it worked in that particular instance. But if let's say if the numbers How were more in the British favors, what's that? Well, what, so you think they're gonna put twenty thousand well armed British officers? How they gonna get all them people up? They didn't have they didn't have train tracks and stuff. They got it. They would have had to conquer the land before they could start building on it, so they could make a side. They didn't have. Uh, they didn't have uh, a helicopters to drop you. How do you think they're gonna get that far inland in the Zulu territory? Well, my my thing is this, right? So what what the thing that it ha ended up happening after that battle is that the British ended up sending fifteen thousand more troops, and then they sent another twenty five thousand. So that's that's my point, and that's when we how many we people? How many? How people. many? Okay, so how many troops did they need to 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 to? Uh, I don't know. Let, let's say how many troops do you think they needed to storm the beaches in Normandy? Well, this, this, in Normandy, this is probably hundreds. This is mechanized modern <laughs> army on mechanized modern army. How many did right. they send? There? Why I would you have to send hundreds of thousands? I want to. I want to ask you a question, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. Why is it that they had to send uh, twenty thousand well-armed troops to fight twenty thousand people with sticks? And, uh, with with spears and 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 cowhide shields. The reason is because the Zulus overall were superior warriors, so they needed to. No, they needed to. They no. needed to. The reason is is because they were willing to die, then quit, or die and lose. So okay. what I'm saying is, see, mm -hmm. I, I don't think you understand the point. See that if push come to shove. There wasn't going to be a Zulu nation. They would have been annihilated because they're going to fight down to the last man and woman and child. That's the mentality uh, of the Zulu. Okay, okay. I see what you're saying. You now, ever you fought somebody that they don't have an off button? Right, right, yeah. You ever fought somebody like that? Like, you know, they say don't lead them crazy people alone. Don't fight crazy <laughs> people. You know why you don't fight crazy people? Oh, absolutely. Because you could be, they could be getting. The crap knocked out of them, and they still won't stop. You might, you might be winning a fight, and they still ain't gonna give up. You know? They don't have an off button. <laughs> you, the the links that you would have to go to stop them, you would literally, you literally put your life on the line fighting one of those people. There's a story about an old bulldog, and this this brings into mind since why you, you guys appreciate this conversation. Please please uh, contribute to the super chat, the cash app, and the PayPal. I appreciate it. There's a story about a bulldog. And uh, it's old Brer Rabbit tale from the South. I don't know where you're from, and I, you sound like a young brother. Yeah, uh, I'm from my grandma. Man. Used, yeah, so my grandma, Mississippi, she used to tell me this story about Brer Rabbit. And I ended up looking into it. There's this old story about this this old hound dog, and uh, hound dog was hungry, and so his master said, "Boy, go on, old dog, go out there and catch that rabbit." And so the hound dog chased that rabbit and chased that rabbit and couldn't catch that rabbit. Eventually, the hound dog went and came back and laid under the porch, and uh, and, uh, and 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 the, and the owner said, "Well, you, you didn't catch that rabbit. You you you're not gonna eat." And he said, "You you know." And so the, the hound dog, you know, it's a story, right? The hound dog said, "Well, hell, uh, he was running for his life. I was just running for my dinner." So the motivations are different. You understand what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Same thing here with the Zulu. Empire. They were trying to get rid of the British Empire because they were interfering with their ability to do herding and and and, and what they needed to do to sustain their nation, the Zulu nation. They were fighting for their livelihood. They were fighting for 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 their families. This is what they were fighting. The Zulu, the the the, 
the, the British Empire was simply fighting to take over some more land to get some more resources. They were simply fighting for a meal. Right. You understand well, I, the different motivations here? Yeah, I get that a hundred percent. But I'll I'll mm -hmm. put it like this. The way I and look at won. it. The, the way I look at it like this, right? To mm -hmm. me, because I'm a I'm a student of military history as well as military <laughs> strategy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for years. Um, I look at the Zulu, that particular battle, right, that you just showed as similar to like a Pearl Harbor type thing. Where it's like, okay, in this particular battle, the like with Pearl Harbor, the Japanese straight crushed that fleet in that particular area. They went all out and really just dominated that battle. But what happened when? But the they US weren't ready they because they, 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 the Japanese came through behind Oahu. They went under the radar. Uh, there's some rumors that they had some intel already. They, you, so they snuck up. The people weren't even ready for a fight. Right. Here, That's the, the way Africans I look at the See, the difference is the Europeans, the British, came over there for a fight. They got a fight and they got annihilated. So their hands were up. In Pearl Harbor, the, the U.S. military, the Navy, their hands were, we weren't ready for a fight. Nobody expected that, even though they had gotten notice that there is an imminent attack. There was a, some kind of message or something like that that said there's an imminent attack plan for Pearl Harbor. They weren't ready. This is the difference. This was not a sneak attack. Matter of fact, the Europeans picked the fight and the Zulus finished the fight. Well, this is the difference between that? So these say, are different analogies, brother. This is why I say it's a sneak attack. All right. Um, it's so, not so a my, sneak attack. Uh, well, let, if let me you just come explain to somebody, it. Brother, no, no, no. Let no, me just explain no, it. No, no, the, the no. It's not a sneak attack. If you come to somebody's land, prepare to fight, and then they come and fight you, it'd be different if the Europeans, uh, if, if the Zulus had invaded the Cape, the white people, the U Europeans, weren't, the Dutch weren't even prepared. And then they came and snuck and slaughtered. That's a that's a you that's the difference. You can't do that, brother. Let's not let's not just talk just to you know. It's not. It's a difference. A sneak attack is when somebody don't know you coming. They knew right. they were coming. You well, came over there for a fight. You got a fight. You got annihilated. Well, what I was just gonna say was that, from my understanding of it, the whole the whole war stuff was that the 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 uh, Zulu got intel. That the British was going to invade the Zulu Kingdom, and they did they, invade the Zulu Kingdom with eighteen hundred people, and they got annihilated, brother. They came over there with eighteen hundred well armed uh, European uh, English military men, and plus some natives and all that. And they got annihilated. Well, the history that I read, and I could be wrong. You could correct me. Yeah, let's wrong, read the history that's here the, right here. The history, about the, we're not even talking about Shaka anymore. You right, brought right. up the point that Shaka, you, you said earlier, that Shaka mm -hmm. never fought in uh, against a European uh, invader. Okay, mm -hmm. you're right. He died at 41, but here's a battle that happened in 1879 where his tactics were used. And the same tactics and discipline that he in, in, imparted on his military carried over into this battle, and it was successful. Right, and I'm not I'm oh. not taking nothing away from the Zulu. I so have what, what's, what's your what, uh, yeah, what well, What's your point? Because we talking my, about shock. Right. I'm trying to understand what the point. My brother. point was that from the history that I read is that the British were coming from 16,000 16, troops. And that the Zulu attacked a portion of those troops, which consisted of that eighteen hundred. That was that was that was pretty much my point. And I, I mean, you could pull well, it you're up. You're talking about what sure happened. On there. You're talking about what happened after they got whooped on. See, well, after I'm, they I'm got whooped, about let me the no, no, because you brought up I'm, something. You already yeah. said you, you know, you know, you already said. And see, Lamont Ellis is saying, let him talk. No, because we're not going to have misinformation. I understand what the brother's trying to say, but there's more to the story. And the brother already said he may be wrong, and I'm gonna tell you where you're wrong. And mm -hmm. no disrespect. So you guys who tell me to cut, I don't do we don't do miss, I don't allow uh mistakes and, and facts that aren't correct to come out of my page. And I know you guys don't like when I cut people off, but I do that because first of all, we're not even talking about shock anymore. We done got all off the subject. This is a side point. The brother came up and said that 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 that, that our brothers never Shock has never won against the military army, meaning he was never really tested. And I'm saying, yes, he was tested through his tactics, even though he had passed. So you guys got to stop telling me 
not to cut people off. We're going to keep this in line with where we headed in this, this conversation. And I, you may not like it, but I understand that. But we don't want misinformation to go out. So what happened was, Jesse, after they got their butt handed to them, information got back to, to, to the, to the, to the uh, English Empire, and they could not let this stand. Remember, this was the greatest army in the world at the time. So the question was, who are these Zulus? Who are we got to crush them? We can't let these people beat us. You know, all these people, the word will spread and we'll have uprisings in all of our different places around the world. Them Africans go, you heard what happened in Haiti. We can't let this spread. So yes, they sent 25, 30,000 troops down there. They had to annihilate them. But even then, the only reason that the Zulu said, you know what? We, we just got to sue for peace. And they came to some sort of peace because his people, he knew how they were trained and knew he was, they would have been annihilated. So they never actually conquered them. What ended up happening was they came to some sort of term and they said, y'all stay y'all butt down there in the Cape of Good Hope. We're going to stay up here. We'll make concessions. So it was never actually an annihilation. That's what you're talking about, Jesse. That's what the history book is. They had to come back and make an example out of the zoos, even though they were never able to do that. You understand what I'm saying, Jesse? Yeah, and that's I think so. We're it didn't work. Saying it the still same thing. didn't work. It I think we still didn't work. I they think we're basically they installed. A they installed a puppet leader, so the Europeans end up winning through politics. They installed a puppet leader. They paid some people off. They bribed some people. That's what ended up happening. Yeah, they, they I think you understand now. Yeah, I think we're basically saying the same thing. The only the only thing we really disagree on is the length. I think that you're talking about the particular battle, and my thing was about I'm not the talking entire about war. Brother, brother, you know brother, 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 you got to – I'm telling you what happened. They got whooped on. They said all you need is 1,800 people. Those are people down there with sticks and knives. We've done this before all across the world. And then they got whooped. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I And agree. then they said now we got a point to prove. So we got to send 20,000, 30,000. And the king at the time said – yeah, okay, we're going to fight, we're going to fight, but it was so many losses that they suffered. They actually won. It was so many losses that we got to sue for peace. Peace. That's what happened, Jesse. That's what happened. They never actually, they didn't get annihilated. You understand right, what right. I'm saying? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. They, they just, from, it was it was a pyrrhic, a pirate victory, as they call it. All yeah, right? All victory. right. Okay. Now, if you want to come back and challenge me, you got some more stuff, information, come on back. I'll be back tomorrow. How are you, Jesse? I'll be more than happy to admit that I'm wrong if I'm wrong. I like to be told that I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like, I, I, I you know, I got it. But I appreciate you. I appreciate it and all respect. And so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm 30, brother. I'm 30. Yeah. Yeah, okay. no, no, that's all right, brother. You you know, Shaka ran, Shaka was running the kingdom at 30. You understand what I'm saying? So, uh, but anyway. We're talking about Shaka Zula. I appreciate everybody. Uh, I'm going to give each person two minutes to, 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 to close out for me. Uh, we'll start with uh, R. Alexis. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are basically we can learn a lot from Shaka. Mm -hmm. We can implement what we learn from Shaka here. We can take his bravery, his intelligence, the ability to consolidate power and strategy, and also to be uncompromising with our enemy and right. take that apply it and become better men. You have a type, you can take the type A personality and use it when needed, but you also must be able to wear the different hat and be a type B personality. And understand that if you can't always go type A because it will consume you and destroy you. That's right. it. Chaos Rain, what do you have? You got two minutes, man, take us home. What did we learn about Shaka Zulu? <laughs> what we have learned, and I want black men that's over 18 and over 30 you should know this, that anything you do, you must know that you have to be disciplined and mm -hmm. you're going to be the bad guy at the end of the day because that's what gets shit done. You get me? And my mm -hmm. thing with, even with the history as laid out, I'm going to say this, and you probably agree with me, Dennis. There was talked about certain Europeans during the time while they were in South Africa when they didn't want to approach Shaka because they knew about this dude. Yeah. So they know twice to even go, even attempt a war with him. So if they're able to avoid him to his death, 
what that tells you about this European man. He doesn't want to be dealing with no competition with no real competent and very ruthless black men. Right. That's one thing I want black men to understand. You got to be the bad guy if you want to survive out here in this world. Anything less than that, you're going to be eaten to the wolves. And that's my end statement. I appreciate that. Thank you, brother. All right, Malika, man, you got two minutes, man. What, what you got to say uh, on Shaka Zulu? Anything else here in the conversation? Um, this brother was the perfect embodiment of masculinity, strength, and courageousness. And we can learn that from him. And, his, and especially in these trying times and this part of the 21st century where masculinity, not just for men, but especially for black men, mm -hmm. it's it's missing. And it's not just yep. the physical masculinity, it's just the mind thinking of, of a man being a strong masculine man, that mm -hmm. warrior thinking. And it's not just physical fighting, but mental and definitely spiritual. And Shaka was the embodiment of that. But um, one of the real good things, and you touched on this, was his zealousy caused his own demise. Right. And a lot of, and the thing was, he never got over his past. And he let his past, where a lot of black men, if we don't get the help of dealing with our troubled past, our success in that ignorance and zealousy and insecurity could be our demise for a future. Mm -hmm. And it might not be having, you know, our relatives coming to kill us, <laughs> but it could wind up in a lot of other things of stress, it could wind up a lot of things of cancer, it could wind up a lot of things of alcohol, drugs, um, not getting in touch. So we can be great, but we got to know when to turn it off, but also we got to know when to stop and mm -hmm. come into realizing, well, what's really conflicting with me? And his greatness was awesome, but at the age of 41, and you think about that, this man accomplished so much at a young age, but at the cost of his death to his own hands of his own relatives because of his zealousy. And um, this is a lot of things where we can learn, and I'm glad that you're taking it from different sides. Right. And it's that's the and that's a great thing as a man too, because when we become older and we become more mature, we peel back the layers and we really start to see things from a mature mind as men. Mm -hmm. Why did he act that way? And I'm glad that you said, well, what caused his death? What do you think? And you're asking questions. And the awesome thing is you're talking to your sons at this at a young age to prick their minds. And I say, you know, it's not about the physical, but it's about the mental. And yeah. your sons were thinking and they were coming with answers. And I said, there you go. Yeah. That's the match of a warrior. Because a warrior has to be strong, both in mental, spiritual, and physical. Not all at the same time, but it's that balance you got to find. And Shaka never really found that balance. Right, right. It's a very interesting story, Shaka, when you really dig into this man's personality. Uh, some of the misnomers about Shaka was that he was just this unrepentant tyrant. But in actuality, he loved his people, he danced with his people, but he understood this was a harsh world we lived in. He was well aware of what the Europeans were doing on the Cape. He had people going down there. He had he had spies looking. He knew what they were doing. He knew their capabilities and was presented with the opportunity to learn about them. He understood what was going to be necessary. First, what? Conceal, uh, congeal, I should say, all the forces. Make himself as strong as he possibly could. Bring them under an iron fist. Discipline and punishment. Severe punishment were necessary because that is the only thing that will keep them. Uh, he knew about the slave trade. He knew what was going on. And those they didn't run up into Zululand still in slaves, not on, not on mass like they did Ghana and these other places. He knew what was going on. It was all throughout Africa that they understood word had spread that these Europeans are taking folks over here to these countries. So what did he do? This is how he protected his people. The only problem that I said with Shaka Zulu is, you know, Shaka was still living with that that anger and that rage that he had built up from his rejection from the issues he had as a young man and it began to tear away at him and his people recognized as you taking us down the wrong path and so they got rid of him i truly believe that shaka un understood that um he understood that he had people who were trying to assassinate him 
I really understood. I really think he knew it was coming. I really think Shaka knew that he could have prevented it if he wanted to. I believe he knew it. he could have. But like many of us who have these suicide by cop tendencies, these suicide by drugs, suicide by alcohol, suicide by hard living, many of us black men who've exhibited or, or, or been through so much pain as young men, we, we, we look forward to it because our lives are pain. No matter what we've assented to, because our lives have been painful, we await, we look forward to death. And this is not living for life, this is living for death. What I ask you guys to do is look to something in your life that motivates you, i.e. your purpose. Figure out what your purpose is and focus on that. That's the lesson that we can learn. That will keep you alive. That will help you turn that corner. That will make you make that pivot that our great king, our great ancestor Shaka, uh, uh, ancestor Shaka did not make so that he can go to the next stage of his life, so that he can go from being this great warrior king to just being a great king who was a warrior. And he'll always be a warrior in spirit. He'll always be with us. But learn from my great king. There's a time to be Shaka. There's a time to have those characteristics, win at all costs. There's also a time to be smart like a fox, like, like King Mansa Musa. There's also a time to say, you know what? Forget what everybody's talking about. I'm out. Like uh, like our brother Abu Kari the second, but for the purpose of this conversation, I want to say thank you everybody for contributing. Malika, Chaos Rain, our Alexis, Jesse Bell the third. It's been a spirited conversation. I appreciate it. It's gone well past the time that I plan to follow. Uh, I mean to to allow, but it carries over like that. And when you enter into these conversations with the public, then you I guess you have to expect that. Nevertheless. You guys have shown appreciation by contributing to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. And I hope I have appreciated you in that I've helped enhance the value of your lives and your knowledge base and have given you something through, through this, these messages, through these, uh, these, uh, these statements, through these, these readings of what is basically public information and help you say, wow, that's something I didn't know about. Now that he put it in my face, I'm going to take it from here and use it. Um, I hope that this helps you. I hope this helps build the character that you want to see yourself as as a man. This is my prayers. This is what I ask the most high to do uh, for you all. But either way, this is Uncle D. I love you guys. God bless you. Shout out to Malika, Chaos, Rain, R, Lexus, Jesse, Vale. Appreciate you guys. It's been a great conversation. Y'all be cool. It's Uncle D. I'm out. <laughs>